the, it was a rough and tough school. It was, the building was new, it was an effort to get around what they feared was needs of uh, desegregation. And it was built with a trophy case. The trophy case was the most pathetic thing as I'd ever seen, it had one trophy in it, 1927 third place track. This is 1955, and that's what Deep Creek had accumulated. So um, I, of course, had the faintest idea how to uh, control disruptive students in the eighth grade or boys who were bigger than I was in the twelfth uh, grade. Uh, uh, and I had a rough six weeks. And finally, I told off the eighth grade students uh, in what could probably best be described as a temper tantrum about how I had not come here to make this a prison, I had come here to make them learn and I was going to make them learn and they needed to behave so that that was possible. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was on a Friday, uh, it was in late October uh, and when I came in on Monday it was a different class. And they had decided to behave, and at Thanksgiving, three weeks later, they sent me, they, all the class signed a card saying, wishing me a happy Thanksgiving, and saying they were glad to be in my class. And from then on, uh, I don't know how much they learned, but we didn't have any discipline problems in any of the classes. And I taught one, one of the eighth grade boys didn't know how to read. Of course, when he didn't know how to read, it was a little difficult to keep him engaged in eighth grade English. Uh, and uh, so every day, his name was Dickie, every day I asked Dickie to do something that he could do for which he could be praised. Uh, the, big ex the big expertise was opening and closing the windows, mm -hmm. which he, of course, could do. And then, to my astonishment, in the spring, he was willing to think about reading, and the first book he read was about Sacagawea, which I didn't know how to pronounce, but I learned. Uh, and uh, he learned to read. Mm. Uh, uh, and the drama class, I was told by the principal in the beginning of the spring term uh, that uh, the, I had to conduct a one-act play and go and, and participate in the competition for the one-act play competition in the Norfolk region. I was aghast at that. I went to the Norfolk Public Library that weekend and checked out three books on how to direct a play. Uh, and so, and the, but we didn't have any money to buy playbooks, so we said go see the typing teacher and see if she has any playbooks in her closet. She did. The True in Heart terrible place, set in a prison, no literary value at all, but it was a mostly boy cast mm. and I had mostly boys in the, my classroom, so it fit. Well, to make a long story short, to my astonishment, uh, we won in the district as the best play. Uh, uh, and then, of course, we had to go to the state, which terrified me. So I drove my 1948 Chevrolet with students and one boy to, uh, drove his family's uh, big car. Uh, and uh, in the, at the state, of course, you had all the suburban Virginia high schools competing and the professors from Duke uh, uh, making the ratings for the play. And uh, uh, they were all, you know, John Millington Singh and appropriate one act plays. And ours, of course, had no literary merit at all. And, uh, but with the, the, they, they did their best. And they had all learned their lines and they'd gotten straight who the characters were and they, they did their best. So, and I thought, oh, thank God it's gonna be over now. Well, at the end of the competition, the director said, we'd like to see the, uh, the, the person from Deep Creek High School who directed the play. Well, of course, that was me. And I was a little concerned about this, in fact, quite concerned. So I stepped out on the stage and I said, my name is Patricia Graham and uh, I teach at Deep Creek High School and I directed the play, he said. And the fancy professor said, 
why did you choose this play? I said, I chose it with, because it was the only one we had at the school and we didn't have any money to buy new ones. Mm. And then he asked me a few more questions. Now he says, I want one of the members of the cast to come out. I want the one who played George. The one who played George was Earl Lee Harrell. Uh, Earl Lee uh, was a boy who was in the class because he couldn't pass English because he was not someone you would normally pick out for rocket science. But Earl Lee was a good boy. He'd done, he'd prepared hard, he'd worked hard. So the, the person, the Earl Lee came out and I was with him and I said, Earl Lee, just answer his questions. And the first question was, how did you learn that accent you used in the play for the prisoner? Earl Lee said, well, that's the way I talk. That was, of course, a little bit of a shock to the, to the uh, judge. And then he said, well, now, Earl, he said, now, how do you get this understanding of the prison? Well, he said, my daddy's often been in prison. Mm -hmm. And the end, end result was that first prize went to a suburban Washington High School and Deep Creek got second prize. Uh -huh. And they got two trophies for their trophy case. And that experience with those kids changed my life. In 1955, you, um, you recall in a book, I think it's SOS Sustainer Schools, that you were 20 years old, newly married, um, and you, in this excerpt, you wrote that this, these experiences made you hooked on school. That's right. That's Why right. hooked on school? Well, I saw what a difference. Giving kids who had few opportunities at home or in their community, giving them good schooling could make an enormous difference in these children's lives. And I saw that uh, I, for whatever reason, uh, was able at Deep Creek, which was one, in those days, one tough school. Uh, uh, I mean, I had, that first term, I had a ninth grade student come into my classroom with a rifle and saying he was going to kill us. Uh, this was very frightening to me. Of course, it was frightening to the children. And of course, my job was to, his name was Robert. My job was to get Robert and his gun out of that classroom and assure the children that I could take care of this and they would be safe. Uh, um, those children need that kind of supportive education. And it turned out I had no idea why or how, but um, I was able to help some of them. Great. What inspired you to return to graduate school and ultimately earn a doctorate from Columbia? <laughs> um, I was teaching by the time I was uh, chairman of the history department at St. Hilda's and St. Hugh's School in New York, and I knew my husband had change from being, I married him, he was a chemical engineer and a Navy officer. Now, for reasons best understood by him, but not by me, he was studying Russian language and becoming a Russian historian. And I could see that we were headed for some little tiny town, someplace with a little college where he would teach us through the rest of his life. And uh, I was teaching history in this high school and it never occurred to me we'd ever again be in a place where there was a really good history department. And Columbia had a very good history department. And uh, uh, he, in his transition from Navy officer, regular Navy, not not uh, reserve, but regular Navy and chemical engineering to Russian history, he had gotten a fellowship, which was for men only, from the Danforth Foundation uh, to become a college teacher uh, and get a PhD in Russian history at Columbia. Uh, uh, and I thought, well, I'll never again be in a community where there's a good history department, and here I am teaching history, and the Danforth Foundation which gave to these boys, said in their little information pamphlet, some of you young men have married too soon 
and your wife may not be appropriate for the wife of a college professor and therefore if she wants to take a course uh, at a university we will pay her tuition so she will have something to say to the dean's wife when you get a job. Well, I had no pride. Uh, by this time I had a master's degree. I'd gotten a master's degree at Purdue when I was fired from Deep Creek because I was pregnant at the end of the year. And, you know, while I was pregnant, my husband by this time, he was, he was overseas and the baby was gonna be born at home. I went back to West Lafayette and I got a master's at Purdue. I had a master's degree. So I thought, you know, I can, I said to Lauren, I said, can you baby, when, when can you babysit? He said, Thursday afternoons, okay? Columbia offered one course in American history on Thursday afternoons. And it was a seminar. That was, I should have, I should have been leery about that. Uh, being taught, it was the first time this man had ever taught a course uh, in the history department at Columbia. Uh, I was a little leery because he had an office at Teachers College and I thought, Teachers College, that's not really Columbia. I want to go to the history department. But he, this was in the history department, but it was a seminar, so uh, I had to go see him. And uh, this, uh, I, made, I went to the secretary, I made an appointment, I saw him. His name was Lawrence Kremen. And uh, I went in to see Mr. Kremen, and I said I'd like to enroll in his seminar in the fall. And he asked me a few questions, and he asked me, he said, have you ever taken a course in the history of education? I said, yes. And then he said, quite understandably, and what did you read for that course? Well, the fact of the matter was, I'd taken it in the, at Purdue in summer school. Uh, we had no money, uh, so I didn't buy the book. I got it, I went to the library and read it on reserve because I was pregnant, I didn't have a baby yet. Uh, so I had free time. And uh, it was the dullest thing I'd ever read. And I remembered it was red and gray, and the professor in the course, uh, I, read, I went to read it before the first exam, because I thought, you know, need to do the reading before the exam. And uh, uh, the, the professor in the History of Education course at Purdue always referred to it as, by, as the book by Butts, R. Freeman Butts. But I knew there was a second author. And I knew it was red and gray, and I so, when he, when Kremen said to me, what did you read for the, I said, a, I said, a book by Butts and Another Man, at which point Kremen's face went red. I thought, I mean, when I saw his face go red like that, I thought, oh my soul and body, was he the other man? And uh, of course he was. Uh, and so he said, well, he said, if you're going to take this seminar, I think you need to do some heavy reading over the summer to be prepared. And he then wrote, listed eight or nine books that I needed to read over the summer. I, of course, wrote them all down rapidly. And I said, thank you very much, Mr. Kremen. And I went to the card catalog at Teachers College and looked up Butts, and of course it was Butts and Kremen. Uh, but uh, mercifully, uh, Kremen lost his teaching assistant for his history of education, big history of education lecture course that fall, so which he gave on Monday nights, uh, 7.30 to 9.10. And so when he lost the teaching assistant, of course he wanted somebody to grade the papers and meet with the students he didn't want to meet with. Uh, he asked me if I would be the teaching assistant because of course over the summer I had read all the books. Mm -hmm. And I'd written him in August asking if there was anything else I should read. And he wrote back, the only time I knew this man till he died, uh, the only time in my life he ever said, no, just take a little vacation. <laughs> uh, but so I worked as his teaching assistant, and then he said, uh, you should get a PhD. Mm. And so I did. Was he your chair? Yeah. And what did you study for your dissertation? I wrote, he was writing a history called, a book called The Transformation of the School, which was the history of the progressive education movement. Now the progressive education movement had an association called the Progressive Education Association. Uh, founded in 1919, collapsed in 1955. It may, you might say it collapsed earlier, but it went out of business officially in 55. He didn't want to bother with the history of the association. So I wrote a history of the Progressive Education Association. Okay, okay. 
Tell us about what brought, brought you back to Columbia for your first tenure track position. Uh, my first tenure track position was actually at Indiana. Oh, okay. Um, the, uh, where I was hired as a tie-in to keep my husband at Indiana when my husband had been offered a job at Johns Hopkins and the dean of this, I couldn't be in the history department because you couldn't have husband and wife in the history department. And so I'd applied to the School of Education, but the dean of the School of Education had been one of the leaders of the Progressive Education Association, of whom I'd been quite critical in my book, and he believed I was not professional enough, hmm. wasn't committed enough to the profession. But then when my husband got the offer at Hopkins, uh, uh, the, the dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Indiana apparently, and my husband said that he liked Indiana, but his wife didn't like working as a secretary at Indiana, which I didn't. Uh, and I thought Baltimore would have more opportunities. Uh, so the senior dean called the ed school dean and said, you need to hire Mrs. Graham to keep her husband at Indiana. He calls me, the ed school dean calls me up on Sunday morning at home and says, I understand I'm supposed to hire you to keep your husband at Indiana. And so my first tenure track job technically was at Indiana University. And from there, he, Lauren was hired uh, at Columbia in the history department uh, on a one-year visiting appointment, which if it worked out well, it would get tenure, which he did. And I was able to get a job teaching at Barnard, running a teacher training program, and uh, which was not a subject I knew a lot about, but I learned quite a lot fast and uh, uh, also teaching the history of education. And ultimately, the, uh, the teacher education program included both Columbia students and Barnard students, and I also had an appointment at Teachers College and in the history department at Barnard and Columbia.